So I want to take you on a journey today, and most of these scriptures, over these 42 years, I've taught these things before, but this is what God put on my heart this week to share with you for today. I love this from the King James Version Bible in Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy. This is the Apostle John who's transcribing these words from Jesus. He says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things. He's done what? He's created all things. You and I did not come from a tadpole. Didn't come from an amoeba. Didn't come from primordial soup. Come on, somebody. Thou hast created all things, and for, oh, this is my favorite part of the verse, and for your pleasure, they are and were created. Now we're going to read from Genesis 1, which familiar verses to all of us, that we know that we are a creation of God. In fact, the Bible teaches us that we are the highest creation of God, because we'll read in just a moment, and you all know this, that we were created in His image and His likeness. I want you to think about this for just a moment. God is good, awesome, holy, powerful, blessed, successful, a God of increase. But God created us with a mindset that I'm going to pour myself into them and they're going to be just like me. They're going to be just like me. They're going to have my grace, my spirit, my wisdom. They're going to have everything they need to succeed on earth as I succeed in heaven. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God said, let us make man, mankind, in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. And I'll skip some over all the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So notice it says that he gave them dominion. You look up the word dominion in the Hebrew text in Strong's Accordance, it gives one word definition, rulership. That's the title of today's message, rulership. God is a ruler. God is not the head of a democracy. He's not. He's the head of a kingdom. And in the kingdom, he rules. But he's transferred to Adam, Adam lost it, Jesus bought it back. He's transferred to believers that same mentality, that same kingdom rulership. We have the ability to rule and reign. Paul said in Romans 5:17 in the Amplified Bible, as kings, by the righteousness of God and the grace of God. Right standing with God because of Jesus' shed blood, because of the cross. We have that rulership ability within us. It's in your spirit, not in your head, not in your body. It's in your spirit, man. So it means rulership. The dictionary defines it as the right and the power to govern and control. The right and the power to govern and control. This is how God operates. God rules the universe. God is in control of the universe. He's in control. But for mankind, you've got to give him control. He won't take control. God doesn't wake you up every morning and say, well, today I want you to eat Cheerios and not Wheaties. He doesn't do that. He gives you those choices of decision. But when you're a man and a woman who is seeking first God and his kingdom and his righteousness, you're having the mindset, the attitude of Christ's likeness in your life. And I know in my life, and I'm, I'm fallible, of course, but in my life, I hit on things by what I would say accident more than I used to on purpose. Things will just happen by accident. Again, that's a poor choice. I can't think of another word. Things will just happen. Why? Because I'm seeking first his kingdom. Things just begin to happen for me. Doesn't mean I, have to, I don't have to fight for the faith. I do. Yeah, you got to do that, which I teach you. But God is so good. When you're just seeking him, good things start happening. 
Why? Because you become more and more like him. You know, and we'll read it later on. The Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus as a believer. Put him on and make no provision for the flesh. Don't compromise. Don't make provision. Well, if A doesn't work, I'm going to go to B. That's the wrong way to live your life as a believer. God wants us to be spirit led. I was thinking about this this morning when I was shaving. Kenneth Hagin, who's gone on to be with the Lord, one of the pioneers of the faith movement, he taught us that to use an alarm is to set your faith back. Something that simple. Something that simple. That if you'll just, Holy Spirit, I want to wake up tomorrow morning at 7.30. He'll wake you up at 7.30. Amen. I know some of you going, what? What? Yeah. Holy Spirit wants to lead us in every endeavor of our, even the little small things. And this is what, this is what one of the precious things in my life that I have with my Heavenly Father. These little things. Little things mean a lot to me. I, maybe you as well. They mean a lot to me. And when God just does little things, it's like, the Penn State, Ohio State football game was on yesterday and they have a tuba player. Before the game on Ohio, they spell out Ohio, the band does, and there's one guy who dots the eye. Those little things are like God darting the eye from my life. It's, it's just, it's precious. And so three things I'm gonna say from the word today that God says that you have rulership over. It's your choice. God will not take rulership where he's given it to you. He will not take it. He will not, will not, will not. He's given you rulership. Now, rulership comes under the headship of the Godhead, of Jesus, our Savior. That we stay in communication with him at all times. And so, the number one thing that we have dominion over and we must exercise is Satan. The devil. In Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give you the authority, the authority to trample, to tread on serpents and scorpions. And that's just a type of, uh, of uh, demon spirits. And over all the power, the Greek suggests this, over all the ability of the enemy. And I love this part. And nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt you. James 4, 7, James wrote, Therefore submit to God. I've already taught that today. Resist the devil. Actively fight against the devil is what that word resist means. And he will flee from you. Amen. The devil laughs at people when they resist him, but they're not submitted to God. He laughs. But you have authority and dominion over the devil. You have rulership over the devil. And I guess for the last year, I've really been motivated by God's Spirit in me to teach more and more along these lines. Because there is so much demonic activity in our world, in the Church of Jesus Christ, universally today. The devil is running an onslaught war against believers. He is. More than in my lifetime since I've been a believer. And so you have to know your rights in Christ. You have to know that you have the ability to resist him. Paul said to us in Ephesians 4, give no place to the devil. He said in 2 Corinthians 2, you're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. That's why I teach it. You need to be understanding of what his devices are against your life. And those devices are primarily lies and deceptions, which are pretty much one and the same. He lies. So you have dominion. You, you have rulership over the devil. Number two. I'll give him three today. Number two, you have dominion over the world system. You know, Jesus said to us in the sermon uh, about uh, the, uh, the harvest, uh, the, the sower sows the word. Mark chapter four, Matthew 13, and I think Luke eight. You'll find it all three of those. And he said, the person that 
is aligned to a thorny heart. Is one who hears the word with joy. But then he said, the cares of this life, the worries of this life. And then he also said, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire, the King James says, the lust for other things entering in, choke the word and their life becomes unfruitful. Now, what I see as a pastor, I think all three of those things are in play today. But I think one of the major ones of those three are the cares of this life, the cares of this world that we have to resist. In Romans 12 to New King James Bible, Paul writes, don't be conformed to the world. Don't, 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 don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorpho. The picture in the Greek, a caterpillar spinning a cocoon, coming out as a butterfly. A transformation. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You've heard me say dozens of times in these 42 years, this is just my opinion. I believe that this verse, I call it the hinging verse of the New Testament for the believer. Why? Your life hinges on doing that verse if you're going to be successful, if you're going to be fruitful, if you're going to enjoy life, if you're going to be happy in life. You've got to start adhering to this verse that you may prove, experience, test out what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amplified says, don't be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs. This world's crazy right now. The world is turned upside down right now. And church, I, I, I want to tell you it's going to get better, but it's not. The world system is not going to get better. Now, you and I can get better. Amen. The church can get better, which I believe we're going to. Yes. But the world's not. He says in the NLT, New Living Translation, don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world, of this world. Amen. I mean, how more plain can you get? This world is trying to suck us into its way of doing things. Paul said, don't do that. Don't do it. You're asking for trouble. You're cruising for a bruising, as my dad used to say. <laughs> the message reads, don't become so well adjusted to your culture. Oh man, what a key word today. That's a hot word today. He said, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. And lastly, the passion translation. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. This is clear, folks. Again, it's your choice, my choice. God will always love us and always be merciful no matter what. That doesn't mean you're going to be successful. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have heartache in your life. Because you will. You start pulling back from the things of God, you're going to suffer things in your life. You start pulling back and going back to the world's way of doing things, you're going to suffer in life. God doesn't want you to suffer that way. The only suffering that you will do in life as a bona fide, on fire, passionate Christian is persecution. For being the way you are. A child of God. Living it out. And of course, let's also teach that the suffering we do, the flesh versus the spirit, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So here's the antidote for all this. First John 5, 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Amen. It's the same word, world, in Romans 12, 2. Cosmos, the world system. He said, and here's the key. This is the victory that has overcome this world system, our faith. Amen. It's how you do. You live by faith every day. Holy Spirit, I'm believing you today that you're guiding my life. I'm going into this sales meeting today. Holy Spirit, you're going to guide me and give me what I need to say. 
Holy Spirit, I have a presentation here from my boss. You're going to give me what to do and say today. I believe it. Help me. Every detail of your life, he would like to be involved. Now, if you don't want him involved, he won't be involved. He's a gentleman. But he will be involved just the way he was with Joseph in Genesis 39. He made him successful and prosperous because God was with him. He'll do that for you as well because he loves you. Remember, he created you with the intent to pour himself into you, to pour his wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding, his anointing, his strength, everything God did, he poured into you. Adam lost it. Jesus bought it back at the cross. Amen. You're born again. You got the new creation living within you. You got God living within you. So you have rulership over the devil. You have rulership over the world system. And you have rulership over your flesh. So what is my flesh? Is that my body? No, no. I guess it can include your body. No, when the Bible talks about your flesh, he's talking about that part of your life that always, even as a believer, even as a strong believer, that always wants to sin. Always wants to do what he wants to do. I can use this word. That part of your life that wants to rebel against God. Well, I'm going to show that pastor. I'm going to show him. I'm going to show my parents. I'm going to show them. I'm going to show my boss. I'm going to show him. That's the flesh. The Bible does not suggest to live your, your life that way. In 1 John 2, 16, John writes, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, this is not from the Father, but it's from the world. It's from the world that you have dominion, rulership over. And these things are constantly attacking us. And listen, you can get victory today, wake up tomorrow morning, start all over again, something else. You, got to, you have to understand this. You're in a fight. The, uh, Paul said in Ephesians 6, you're, you're in a war. There, there's warfare taking place around your beautiful life. He said, these things are not from the Father, the desires of the flesh, the eyes and the pride of life. Look at Galatians 5, 17. He says, for the desires of the flesh are against the Holy Spirit. Pretty clear, isn't it? Isn't that clear? It's clear. The desires of the flesh, they're the antithesis of what Holy Spirit desires for your life. They're opposite. See, you can choose to be mad and angry because you don't understand something or you do understand something in your narrow point of view, but that's not Holy Spirit. That's not Holy Spirit. That's you and your flesh. The enemy's behind all of it, of course, because he wants you to be a hater. He wants you to be angry and become embittered. That's what he wants. So we love to point the finger at somebody else. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's the pastor. It's the Sunday school teacher. It's the parent. It's the boss. It's my husband. It's my wife. It's always somebody else. Too strong for you today? No, we need to change. The desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And their desires or the yearnings of the Holy Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So strong. Now, in Matthew 13, this, these, this is a great story. In Matthew 13, Jesus, this is just not too long before he's about to go to the cross. And he's teaching his disciples and the 70 and the other people, the multitude, he was teaching them that he came from heaven. That's what he said. You can read it for yourself. He said, I have come down from heaven. Well, that freaked them out. But then he said, he made another statement. He said, I am the bread from heaven. Uh-oh. And then he started talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Oh, they freaked they freak big time. Yes, Amen. Let's read it. In Matthew 13, 
54. When Jesus had come to his own country, he taught them in the synagogue so that they were astonished. <laughs> yeah. And they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? They said that sarcastically. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother Mary? In other words, they grew up with him. And his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get all these things? Where did he get all these things? Listen now, verse 57. So they were offended at him. Everybody say, so they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. It's amazing. So when you look up the word offended in the Greek concordance, it's the Greek word skandalizo. It's spelled S-K-A-N-D-A-L-I-Z-O, skandalizo. This is what it means, to entrap. That is to trip up, to entice to sin, a trap, a stumbling block to cause to stumble and fall, to put a stumbling block or impediment in the way upon which another may trip and fall. This is a characteristic that the enemy puts into people's lives by way of the flesh. They get us offended, scandalizo. To get us pointing the finger, it's your fault. Your fault. I'm this way because of you. If I never married you, I wouldn't be this way. In Romans 13, 14, again, I alluded to this earlier. Paul writes, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify his desires. So as a Christian, you got to put him on. He's in you, but you got to put him on. Romans 8, 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Holy Spirit is Life and peace. Let's finish the story going back to John 6, verse 60. When his disciples heard all this, look what many of them said. Look, look, look what they said, church. This is a hard and difficult and strange saying. It's hard. It's difficult. It's weird. It's strange. And then an offensive and unbearable message. This is what they all said. They all said this. Who can stand to hear it? Who can be expected to listen to such teaching? You see what offense does to people? Come on. You see how jaded people get when they get offended? But Jesus, verse 61, knowing within himself that his disciples were complaining and protesting and groaning about it. Come on now. Who is all the quiet in this Presbyterian church? <laughs> he knew within himself they were complaining, they were protesting and grumbling. You know what he said to them? Is this a stumbling block and an offense to you? Does this, ups this is Jesus. Does this upset and displease and shock and scandalize you? Look at verse 66. After this, many of his disciples drew back, returned to their old associations. That's what people do when they're offended. That's what they do. They go back to their old associations. They go back to what they know best in the flesh. That's what they, that's what they do. 100% of the time they do it. And no, lore, no longer accompanied him. Oh, how sad. Jesus said to the 12, will you also go away? And do you too desire to leave me? Look what Peter said. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words, the message of eternal life. Amen. Amen. Peter did something right there. I promise you they were offended too. The Bible says they were. They were all offended. But he had enough temerity in his life to not turn back with the rest of them and to go forward. And he ended up preaching the very first New Covenant sermon in Acts chapter 2, the very first one. The day the church was formed and created, he 
preach the first message and I close with Galatians 5.13. Paul writes, for you were called to freedom to liberty, brothers, church. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You know what love will never be? Offended. Love will never be touching. Love will never look with the stink eye at somebody. Won't do it. That's an old term, stink eye. Love won't do that. See, some of you right now, you're very uncomfortable because the word has hit you right square between the eyes. I understand that. I understand that. You needed it. Some of you need this. Some of you did. Some of you, this is just graving. For some of you needed this. It's a word spoken in due season. Yes, sir. You have rulership over the devil. Yes, sir. You have rulership over the world system. You have rulership over your flesh. My advice, my counsel, exercise it. Exercise it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we learned today, one of the very first gifts God gave mankind in Genesis 1 was the gift of dominion or rulership. And so today I showed you that you have authority over three entities in this world. Number one, you have authority and dominion over the devil. Number two, you have authority and dominion over the world system. And number three, you have authority and dominion over your flesh. The Bible says, greater is he who is in you than he that's in this world. You have God's dominion, God's authority to rule and reign in life as a king and a priest through the Lord Jesus Christ. I wanna thank you for joining with me on The Voice of Faith today. I remind you, God loves you, we love you. Till we see you next time, God's blessings be yours. The message you heard today from Pastor Don K. Wood is part of a series called Giving God Your Heart. At OCFC.store, you can stream or download this complete series and many other life-building messages anytime, any place. Start your free trial today. Voice of Faith is produced at Odessa Christian Faith Center, a church that is always building great lives. We are located at 9000 Andrews Highway in Odessa, Texas. Our Sunday worship services are at 9 a.m., 1045 a.m., and 1230 p.m., which you can watch live at ocfc.online.church. We also worship together on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Find out more about us at ocfc.org.